So the recruits actually got farther last week than the scholars did. Yes, they did, which is actually on, uh, not uncommon. Usually the scholars are slower, um, but um, hey. they've been more for the keeping pace. So I don't mean slower mentally. I mean slower <laughs> pace-wise. Yes, <laughs> but, we uh, did, and we all know it. Anyways, on that note, <laughs> that's a good place to start. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody, okay. to our um, a Back to the Sal study course, uh, a meeting time again. Um, the purpose of this course is to... Uh, look through the Getty step by step and take note of all the things that we might miss if we were um, training on the floor. Because, of course, there is lots of uh, distance between what's in the manuscript and what we end up training all the time on the cell floor. So in preparation for our return to the cell in 2021, although perhaps that's still slightly optimistic, but who knows, um, we're taking a look through the Getty and um and, and having a great time and after that um i think we'll move on to vadi so that'll be very very cool um we've been we've been starting this project or we started this project from the very beginning looking at um the preface uh, of fury we didn't really look at the uh introduction per se but we looked at his uh preface to abrazari and then we've been reading it from start to finish right now we are in the sword and two hands section almost at the end of the unarmored, uh, the, the section about unarmored fighting per se, uh, although that really isn't true, is it, <clears throat> um, in the book before we hit the Senyo and then the rest of the armored plays. Um, I uh, am principally leading us through this um, examination, so you're getting um, mostly my view, although I'm very happy to have uh, the scholars and other um, free scholars who um, are able to attend um, include their thoughts as well um, but it's important you know of course that my view is merely one of many and um, we as a teacher said I'm a certainly hope that you don't believe anything is so just because we said it we want you to critically think about the manuscript and about the evidence that he, uh, informs your view and we want you to be convinced principally by the same evidence that convinces us for believing something is X and Y um, Lastly, I will add, I will add mm -hmm. something. There. Please, Cal. Uh, the word of Brian only counts when it's the last beer in the fridge. <laughs> okay? So other than that, that's a really simple way to say it. The people say, well, Brian said this, or Aaron said that, or Aldo said this. We all have <clears throat> the same basic material and have spent countless, countless hours working through it. And... Uh, we still have no hundred no. percent uh, agreement on everything, but I would say we're pretty pretty deeply agreed to to the ninety eight to ninety nine percent level on uh, on mm. fury, anyways. Mm. And of, and of course, there's a there's a big difference, and I would I would hope and I would trust that everyone um, keeps this in mind when they are training on the cell floor <clears throat> that there's a big difference between discussions like this, like what we're having. Or, you know, any, a kind of theoretical discussion that you can have off to the side or with your friends uh, and, and Emma or whatever, and actually being in class on the south floor. When we're in class on the south floor, it's the instructor's job to move everybody along according to some kind of a program and, and teaching schedule. And um, there isn't time for the kind of um, debate and discussion that is, we have time for in something like this, right? Um, so, uh, you know, I think oftentimes, this is a brief aside, but um, I think oftentimes if you only experience uh, the theory of Fiore and the study of Fiore on the South Floor and you don't experience it in any kind of other uh, speculative context, it might perceive to you that the only times you're listening to your instructors tell you things, it's, okay, do this, go here, do that. No, that's not right. No, this isn't right. And it's important that you know, of course, that when that's happening on the floor, it's in the context of, you know, a, a training environment where there's one cook in the kitchen and now it's time to do what the teacher says, right? But that's not to say that outside of that training context, that's how it is, because it's not. This is a scholarly pursuit and it's important that everybody critically engage in the manuscript because that's what makes our community uh, richer, 
if there's only four, four or five people thinking about the manuscript, then what happens when those people are gone, right? Then, then it's all gone. So, um, so it's important we do this is the, is the bottom line. And the more people we have doing it, the better and the richer it becomes. And with that note, lastly, in this somewhat labored introduction, if you have any questions or any, or want to bring up anything or look at anything in particular, as we go through this, please do make it known. All right. Uh, if chances are, if you have a question, five other people have it as well. Okay. So. Um, that's done. So to get back into it, um, we are again in the sword and two hand uh, hand section. As I um, personally envision it, the sword and two hand section is broadly speaking uh, categorized this way. We have the guards, which comprises the first six guards plus that one big paragraph of about footwork and the turns of the sword, and then we have the twelve guards with the red uh, labeling. And then we have the four cuts, and then a prefacery introduction, and then we have the Largo section, the Strato section, and then a final master. So we are still in the Largo section. Well, I think we'll complete it today, and we'll actually move on to dip our toe into Strato, which is pretty exciting. So today's going to be a big day. It's going to be lots to do. So we might as well get into it. Last week, we finished off pretty late because we had some technical issues. So um, we kind of... We got to the breaking of point and exchange of point last week, and um, which is, sorry, the breaking of point is 26 VA, and the breaking of point, the first one anyway, is 26 VC here in the Getty. And we kind of trailed off around here. I think we may have talked about the 11 Scholar, and then um, that was pretty late. So we're going to just quickly review that um, on Kel's uh, suggestion at the end of last class, and um, then we'll... Um, We'll, we'll close it off. We'll keep going because about this point, we've almost made it through. So <clears throat> the breaking of point and the exchange of point. OK, so <clears throat> the exchange of point play here is 26 VA. And briefly speaking, it is it's a way of counter thrusting an enemy. So they come in with a thrust to you and you claim the center and step in with a counter thrust to them where um, yours lands and theirs doesn't. And in that sense, it's similar, or at least how we understand this play, is similar to how Emma understands the logic of the first master. Um, in that this counter thrust, this exchange of point, if done well, is almost or practically equal to a single time remedy. All right, at least that's what we're aiming for with this um, six master. Uh, uh, excuse me, which the 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 six scholar. Um, the exchange of point comes right with the breaking of point because you could you have an opportunity to break the point if the exchange of point fails. So in a similar sense, you know, uh, up here with the first master, if the single time remedy fails, obviously, of course, there's other things you can do. So, you know, it's not the end of the road in any sense. So we try for the single time remedy and then we do the things that come after, which are also fine. They're also good, if not quite as good as the single time remedy. So if the first master fails, of course, we have things to do. If the exchange of point fails, we have things to do, principally the breaking of point. Um, although notably, the breaking of point can also be done on its own, if tactics uh, are permitted. What's the breaking of point? The breaking of point is the act of suppressing the enemy's sword into the uh, the earth, such that their sword is trapped against the earth. Okay, and this is distinct from um, you know expelling the blade. Right now, I mean, now we're kind of talking about really fancy, fancy terms, but the, the, an expulsion in swordsmanship generally involves sending their sword, the enemy's sword somewhere else. Right. And it's intuitive to, you know, the meaning of the word expulsion. You begin engaged, you do an expulsion and you end not engaged. Right. Your swords end up not touching because you've expelled their sword in a direction you want. The breaking of point isn't an expulsion, 
because there's n there's no real guarantee that if you send the sword to the ground, it's going to stick in the ground, right? There's no there's no real way to be sure about that. So when you break the point, as 26 VC shows us, when you, you break the point here, you need to follow it down to the ground in a true cross to stick it into the ground or trap it to the ground if it's a hard surface in order for this to count as, you know, being useful or to, to count as being a breaking of point as such. One of the ways the breaking of point uh, attempts fail very often is the enemy sword escapes from under your sword. And often this is a this is as a result of having too oblique an angle on the uh, sword you're overbound. So when you're breaking a point, you are over the enemy sword. The enemy sword is under yours. Okay. And if you don't pin it to the ground in something of a true cross as best you can, then there's a good um, there's a good chance the sword could skip out. And it, that chance increases the more oblique the angles are of your of your swords. Um, and of course, if it skips out, it can immediately rise again and actually leave you low. So that's a very, very bad thing uh, to do or to have to have happen. Um, but both of these can be done against against thrusts. OK, these the breaking a point and the exchange of point are presented in um, Largo under the context of uh, handling thrusts. So they're both things we can do from the breaking of point, we have opportunities to step on the sword depending on where the sword embeds itself in the ground and the proximity of our feet although there is some debate about that um, in emma some uh, scholars and free scholars have no issue with significant motions of the feet to achieve a step on the sword um, others do i think actually cal and i are aligned on this that we prefer you know attempts to step on the sword only when the sword is in your presence in, in the presence of the of the lead foot, uh, kind of like the hand the hand grab. Um, correct me if I'm wrong on that uh, on that, Kel. Yeah, um, no, I'm with yeah. you there. But there, you know, in within M, of course, there is some there is some variation on that, and isn't that interesting? Also, we sh we see <clears> in the breaking of point plays. So here the here's the archetype 26 VC, and then we have 26 VD and um, 27 RA, which show things we can do from the breaking of point. Um, including stepping on the sword, cutting up false edge to the arms, and also cutting a fendenting. Okay. Um, now, um, yeah, anyway. So that, broadly speaking, is Fury showcasing the breaking of point. Does anybody have any questions about exchange or breaking of point? I tried to make that fairly sprightly of a summary mm -hmm. bd here uh, just a quick question what about exchanging the thrust if it's a high thrust great question it's a great question so <clears throat> fiori doesn't um well hold on hold on a minute i was about to lie to you <laughs> although usually saying fiori doesn't is is you know you have a 50 50 chance so um Fiore has examples of high thrusts. We see, um, we see one of those images I chose in the spear section. So um, th there are examples of high thrusts in the spear section. There are, there, um, I don't think there are in Polex high thrusts per se. There, oh, I fucking lied. See, there you go. There are examples of high thrusts in Polex, as well as examples of high thrusts in... Uh, Sword in two hands. Okay. Uh, it, 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 in armor, excuse me. So, first of all, to that question, it's important we establish that there are high thrusts, they do exist, and Fiore has them. Okay. Though, admittedly, they are later in the book, and they're not with, the sword, with both swords, uh, sorry, both hands on the pommel. The question is, how do we respond to them if Fiore doesn't say anything else? Because he doesn't actually address this in this this half of the manuscript i don't think um although i would be remiss in in saying i just you know remembered we have also seen high thrusts in the sword in one hand 
and also in the um, the dagger and sword section, right? In the sword in one hand, of course, the, one of the principal threats is a high thrust. So of course, that's in the first half of the book. So there's so there's an example, um, and uh, and of course we we see this parry and threat in the dagger versus sword. So there's high thrust everywhere. There you go. There's the the quick answer. But he doesn't really talk about how to deal with high thrust per se from uh, a true distance, hand, body, foot, and some bombs a high thrust at you. So because of that, we're left to um, speculate as to how, how one might do it. One thing we can um, probably agree on, I would hope anyway, is that the exchange of point doesn't work against high thrusts. The exchange of point is only really going to work against thrusts um, you know, chest height and lower, right? N nothing in prime or high fourth hand position. Um, so um, let's, uh, let me use a snip, snip. Da, 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 da. So here's a chest. Hey, look. Oh, I have the, I don't want that one. I just want this one. There we go. Okay. So, <clears throat> So here's, here are all the angles that you could thrust from, right? In this U, right? These are all the angles that one could thrust from. At about chest height or so, maybe a little lower. Maybe I was a little too um, uh, eager with that line. Um, beyond this line, above this line here, ex the exchange point is likely not going to work. So we're going to have to do other things against thrusts that are high on, on either side. If we're doing other things, then really, you know, f failing direct uh, commentary from Fury, then whatever works here works. Me personally, um, high thrusts are very apt, I think, to being set aside on the flat. Generally speaking, high thrusts are going to come in prime position. So they're going to come um, just like third, right? J just like third, but they're going to come with the f both sides of the sword facing your left and right side so they're very easily beaten away or or slightly deviated um, plus because the hands are high slightly deviating their hands while they're extending themselves puts their hands and arms in, in massive danger to a counter cut by you so i would say you know one of the bread and butter responses to any high thrust is to deviate the point and counter cut the extended arms and hands um, do you have any other solutions there kel um counter in frontale and proceed as you will whether it's a cut or a thrust there there's uh, another one mm -hmm. there's a, there's an awful lot of in the first master, I'm not sure how he words it. He starts off with uh, Fendente or not. Mm. But the same cover uh, of the first Remedy Master works perfectly well against a high thrust. Sure, uh, yeah. Probably, as you say, mm -hmm. countercut mm -hmm. as opposed to exchange a point mm -hmm. uh, because your points are both too high. You mm -hmm. could conceivably invert uh, or make your cover mm -hmm. in Fenestra and then you know counter thrust but that's that that one's a dog's breakfast most of the time yeah it's it's really sloppy stuff yeah so um so just to underline kel's point and i absolutely agree with that that while you know you could theoretically imagine um exchanging the point somehow if he's coming in in prime and you're coming in in prime you know you're both kind of in finestra and you're kind of trying to exchange the point in a sort of a mirror-esque way that you would do it if you were both in in third. But that tends to, as Kel said, uh, says, be a dog's breakfast. And it actually tends to be rather dangerous. Um, and the, the boring, conservative uh, way to deal with it, I think, is just to um, uh, cut it. Uh, and you don't, you, don't have to, you don't have to cut it very very hard either, right? Thrust can be set oh, no. aside with the strength of a child. So, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. It's, it's not... Uh... It's not common enough for him to comment on it. So I think that yeah. uh, anyone that is capable of throwing a high thrust has enough sense mm -hmm. and experience mm -hmm. to realize the disaster awaiting him or her. 
Right, and and actually, that's that's probably why um, this is completely speculative, of course. But that that's probably why there's a lot of um, uh, there's a lot of um, high thrust used as provocations in lots of other sword arts or prov uh, provocative kinds of actions, um, rather than something that you would you know in, from true distance give a high thrust and really expect it to land and step behind it. Something that you're you know something more like you're rising the sword up. You're putting the point in their face and you're squeezing the distance like that to get them to react. And then as soon as the sword is engaged, you're going to move out of it, cut or, you know, engage around or whatever. But the high thrust has some very significant weaknesses, right? And being able to be brushed aside uh, very easily uh, and have your hands high and extended is, is definitely one of them. Uh, so, yeah. Um, does that answer your question, Beatty? Do you have any? Uh, do you have any th uh, thoughts to add to that? No, nope, that's exactly what I wanted. Thank you. Right. Um, okay, cool. So, um, if uh, that being said, then um, that more or less ties up our, I guess, summarizes at least in brief, um, mm. our exchange and, and breaking of point. We still have some more plays to do, of course, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. now we're moving on to some of the uh, the fun ones. Um, so the first fun one is the 11th scholar, uh, and I'm going to get a second chance to describe how this works. But this is another party pleaser. Um, if you're looking to impress people, this is one that you can do. And I think like I, I said on Monday, oh, we should read the text first and everything. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's read the text first. This is 27 RB in the Getty. And can we have uh, Alex read the text for us? This is another play pertaining to the breaking of the thrust. If after I break his thrust, the opponent lifts his sword to parry, I need mm, to... Alex is flashing, but I'm hearing nothing. Oh, really? Oh, I'm yeah. hearing him. Oh, that's weird. I can hear him. That's weird. Oh, that's weird. Um, okay, Alex, we're going to roll with the punches. I'll, I'll read this uh, this text here. This, a couple people are having issues with your audio um, for some reason. Sorry about that, man. Um, this is another play pertaining to the breaking of the thrust. If, after I break his thrust, the opponent lifts his sword to parry, I immediately put my hilt within his right arm, near his right hand, and qu quickly grasp my blade near the point with my left hand, wounding him in the chest. If I want, I can also place my sword to his neck and slit his windpipe. Okay, so what the hell is this? How, how the hell does this work? Um, so like I tried to say on Monday, I have absolutely no idea. I've never... Um, been able to figure this play out on, on my own, but I did see somebody, some some European club, do this once, and I I've done it. I uh, well, that <laughs> I never saw you do it. <laughs> then, like in, no. in class, what, I, what what I'm trying to say is, I saw that I saw this solution no. from someone else. Um, but I wouldn't have seen it. Uh, I wouldn't have likely seen it in class because this is not something very often that we do in um, in class. And we may have done it at a party, but then there was the drinking, and I probably wouldn't have remembered. <clears throat> So that's my excuse. All right. So, um, so what's going on here? Um, so one, eh, what the hell's going on with my mouse? Oh. So, um, one narrative as to how this play occurs is is this, and we're gonna, I'm gonna get the breaking of point play here. Okay. Here we go. Here we go. So let's just say you've broken the point, and you're the scholar here. Okay. When you break the point. Um, here, you're threatening a cut up um, to the opponent's face. And because they're underbound, there's nothing that they can do, uh, or there's almost nothing that they can do to stop you, right? This isn't an, uh, you know, you cutting up into their face. It's not an impossible to defend play, but this person's in big trouble super big trouble right especially if this if the scholar is sprightly in their actions so as soon as the sword is bound down and the scholar feels the pressure start to leave their brain should be flashing with all the all the alarms possible because it that's going to feel to them like their sword is leaving to come up right which would be also what you'd expect so if the, this the enemy here feels that they're likely to follow 
if for no other reason to keep contact with their sword, okay, with the with the enemy's sword. And this is a good lesson for people kind of going back to what we talked about at the beginning of the Largo section with the logic of how fencing, um, good, of how good fencing often works. It, once this sword leaves, once the scholar sword leaves, the first thought in this guy's mind is not, oh, his sword's gone now, where, where can I hit him? Right? The first thought is, holy shit, his sword's leaving, where is it going? I need to find it. Exit stage right. Right? Yeah, and also get the hell out, right? Because um, it's a good bet it's about to be embedded in you. So once this um, once this sword is bound down, the scholar can rise up as if to do, or even attempting to do, this cut, this false edge cut to the face. When the scholar does that, it's not it's not a bad move at all for this person to kind of maybe shift a little bit back, you know, make a little distance and follow the sword up and refuse to leave their sword on the ground and try to keep contact with that sword as it's coming up. The result of which is that both these swords are going to rise. Okay, everybody with me so far? So both these swords are going to rise and they're going to end up, you know, semi-crossed. Okay? I don't agree with that. Oh, they're not. They're not going to be crossed. Not, not, not necessarily going to be crossed. Okay. Okay. Sure. Uh, well, uh, maybe the scholars ahead, right? Maybe they're maybe they're struggling to catch up. Sure. <clears throat> yeah. Um, if if the if the the enemy is lucky, they're crossed, right? If they're late, if, they won't. If, they, the, the, if the Zug is trying to get out of the way of that sword because he knows where it's going yeah. and that's under his face, mm -hmm. uh, like this is the play where he says that I'll cut you under his your beard if i'm not mistaken uh, this one yeah uh, that's right yeah yeah okay so if he if the the scholar hasn't stomped on the zugador's blade and trapped it the zug can escape with a uh, pass back with the left yes or uh, something yeah. like that and in that in that process he's also shifting sides yeah so that's how he gets into the foot position for this fine you know this forward fourth plate um, 27 RB, and in that same moment, by uh, changing feet to the opposite side, the uh, mm -hmm. the scholar gets to the opposite side of the Zug's blade and can drop his pommel into the crook of his elbow, as you were talking about. And last week, this right. is, when we got towards the end of the evening, that's the part that you missed because there's a significant flinch response here mm -hmm. by anybody. Anybody with common sense goes, oh, no, my sword's trapped down. Even if I bring it straight up, you're just going to add uh, energy to the sword that's coming towards your face. Well, get the face out of the way. And that process sets up the relational footwork and uh, a spatial uh, situation of the fourth plate. Uh, that's right. So in this really extremely shitty drawing I'm trying to show here, what's what's going on here is just what Kel described, which is, let me get rid of these tabs, which is that when the, yeah, there we go, when the swords come up, as the yeah. swords are coming up, this um, as the hands are rising, there's there's going to be an, an opening. There's going to be a hollow opening developing right here on the enemy. Right. And as soon as the swords rise and the the hands of the of the scholar are basically right across from that hole, they're going to push their pommel out and push their hands out and come around this sword and drop the pommel into this hole here with a with a little bit of footwork okay i should i should underline that this is actually one of the reasons why this is a party pleaser is because it's actually it looks rather complex it's not really that complex to do but it's definitely i'm sure it's pretty you know complex to describe so you're going to have to um, bear with us of course here this is a an, an insufficient medium to to describe this play but nonetheless so when when these swords come up a an opening a hole is uh, um oh no i'm not in the thing a hole is made here between the um the the elbow and the hand and the sword and it's going to be a little space here and it's just big enough to put the pommel in 
and so and where this play works and why it's it's pleasing to see is because this entry because it is an entry it happens in the tempo of the rise of the scholar so um just like kel said having uh, being underbound and, and feeling that pressure uh lesson is 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 terrifying and you're definitely going to come up as quick as possible and it's in coming up as quick as possible if you know that you're causing that action in the enemy if you can feel that you can anticipate that and set to your next intention which is to drop this pommel in here okay and um once you drop it in then you can press the sword against their neck and leverage this whole geometric structure against the enemy and they're basically kind of stuck and you can potentially leverage their head all the way to the ground uh here right the only way they could get out of this structure is if they let go of their sword they have to they have to give up their sword entirely because it's the junction the pummel is helping lever this person in the junction of the they hand to, and the sword they have to let go with the right hand yes no, the, the, the right hand the right hand you're right have to let go with the right hand you're right yes oh yes you're right when you get into the armored section this yeah. stuff becomes very clear right and that's that's the last thing i wanted to bring up which i forgot to mention i think last time when we ended on it was that it's fascinating to see this play um not least in the largo section um, because this kind of thing is something that happens very often in armor. It's one of those things that you're looking for in the play with the sword in two hands in armor. Um, and it's, I think it's also in other, in other places as well. So um, again, if we needed any more evidence to see that Fiore is always thinking about fighting in armor, um, with you know he's he's looking at unarmored stuff with one eye and arm, armored stuff with the other eye this is another i think clear example because it's something and directly it's you do mm -hmm. it's also interesting that he does not have his usual admonishment of oh and this is better in armor he yeah anything about it yeah, that's right these mm -hmm. two these two are not gonna uh their blades aren't going to connect unless by accident because one's yeah. trying to get out of dodge and the other's going mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. to the other side of it. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit like the footwork of the uh, Punta Curta y Fonsa, mm -hmm. right? It's a little bit like that. Which we will see momentarily. Yeah. We're going to see that in a few places. Won't well, that be fun? And that's a sweet play. Yeah, that's a, that's a sweet one. And, we, and we've actually seen people pull that off at... Um, on fight nights before not too many times of um, course but on oh, occasion I've done it at least three times yeah i did it to egal so bad that my sword got stuck in his gambeson <laughs> that's good oh, he's walking man. around with my sword sticking out of his gambeson that's funny i bet he hammed it up too because he's a he's a champ oh man <sighs> memories all right yeah so um this play here 27 rb it is an entry it's an entry generated from a breaking of point which threatens a cut under the beard that's going to be my my um my simplistic formula there for you to draw this play right obviously there are lots of other places where it could be done if the situation's right whatever fine but if you wanted a strict answer i would say that it's that it's this something you can do from being overbound and i think it's uh you i think you're required to be overbound on the right i think it only works on one of the sides i think left last time i did it the left if you're right-handed uh, yeah you, you you overbind him on hit your left which is his right and it's suffering. right yeah that's right being, so being, being yeah. underbound mm -hmm. on the mm -hmm. right is the worst position for sword play and we see that in 133 yeah. as well yeah it is it, it is the worst so um yeah so that's right so it's you have to be overbound so the the enemy needs to be overbound on their right so the bind the the, the binding has to be on their right and it's going to be your left if you're this if you're the scholar mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. and it doesn't work on the other side last time i i tried it i think not unless you're left-handed yeah but those people are weird anyway who wants them all right yeah, <clears throat> you're fun to fight <laughs> <laughs> um uh, all right so um that was fun um moving on to a play that we've never seen before and that's entirely unique 
<laughs> 27 RC. Uh, dear, dear. Andrew, would you like to read this play for us? After beating the opponent's point or crossing his sword, I place my hand behind his right elbow and push strongly, causing him to turn and offer an opening. As he does so, I can strike him. Thank you. And let's let's finish this in the same breath, because Fury's about to beat us over the head, literally, <laughs> with, with this play. 27 RD. You want to give us a go, Andrew? The student before me was right. He was <laughs> able to make you turn around so that I could sever your head. Even before you could come back to the parry, I could open a gash in your back. You. Mm. Okay, thank you very much, Andrew. All right. So 27 RC and 27 RD. So um, lest we think we were getting away from it and we were finally leaving the elbow push behind. <laughs> Think no more. Oh, here's here's the obligatory elbow push. All right. I'm pretty sure it's in everything, including the equestrian section. I believe it is. I I, I believe it is. Um, interestingly, and maybe this is reading too much into it, but I certainly read this as being specific in in swordsmanship to the right side of the enemy. I don't think it's as useful on the left side. Um, the right hand being the print, the hand that's principally uh, di directing their sword. But you know, uh, it's also it, the right side is also the side that's um, most accessible to your offhand, right? If you're right-handed, your offhand is left, and their right side is going to be directly accessible most often. Excuse me, to your left side, so it's the natural place to kind of look for for elbow pushes anyway. Um, but it's not that you couldn't do it on both sides, in theory. Um, but an elbow push, right? Nothing super fancy about it. Nothing mystical. We know all about this by now. Um, some of you might may ask, um, what planet did the necklace guy come from? Uh, this is another one of the mystical creatures in Fury. The guy's drawn without necks. But um, my jokes aside, um, <laughs> this is a pretty simple play. He elbow pushes them. And he uh, he opens his cranium. What are you going to do? Um, there, some people. No, wait. Let me let me rephrase this better. Some may read this image as being somewhat exaggerated. In that we see a figure here who's facing the scholar. And then we see a figure here who's facing away from the scholar. Hey, and the Connor. scholar's hitting him in the back. <laughs> hey, Connor, does this look familiar to you? Yes, Cal. <laughs> <laughs> so it is, um, so two things on this, all right? And this actually, uh, uh, this catches people by surprise more often than I, um, I, uh, um, uh, more often than not. And that is that, number one, elbow pushes can do this. Okay. And number two, you won't get this if you don't try for it. So uh, one of the... Um, you can write this down in Aaron's platitudes about the, the uh, disadvantages training in schools. One of the difficulties that fencers have training in schools like ours is the relative decorum and politeness of everybody who walks in the door and even when we say okay we're going to do martial arts stuff to each other and it's going to suck a bit people go out of their way to be exceedingly polite and to not make other people too dis uh, uncomfortable just in principle right even if they're trying to do stuff that's that's naturally uncomfortable so why am i talking about this Oftentimes, when we do elbow pushes on the floor, when we're training, oftentimes we hold back from doing them in a, struct in, in a structurally powerful way that might cause something like this. And we hold back because, you know, isn't this excessive? Right? Yes. I mean, if we're just training, you know, uh, why, would it, why do I need to do this to somebody? Uh, why can't I just kind of push them a little bit? Right? And he'll be like, oh, you got me. And it was fine. 
So I'm bringing this up is because one of the things that we need to keep in mind, uh, in my opinion, when we're when we're training on the south floor, is not to make the mistake that we never do this and forget about what the you know full actions entail, right? And not to get too caught up in our own politeness, uh, especially when doing things like elbow pushes. You had uh, people had thoughts, BD Kel. Yeah, mm -hmm. if I may interject for just for a Please. second, it's BD here. Mm -hmm. So. This brings up a good point about training for intent and intensity, as well as talking about displacement in armored plays. So just here at Guelph, as people get more advanced, the recruits get more advanced and get closer to scholar test uh, readiness, then our instructors make a point of asking them if they're ready to be uncomfortable and then having them put into hot seats of scenarios where they're 15, times in a row, they're 15 boats in a row with no rest, higher intensity wrestling, and plays such as this, where we come in and push them right around. Fighting, wrestling somebody twice your size, for example, is not fun, right? No. Nope. Uh, so yeah, yeah, you, on... you run into that so often. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, okay, I've, I've got a comment there before you go on. Um, I see your point about uh, being overly gentle. Uh, however... Uh, when I demonstrate this play or any sort of elbow push in a class, I'll push people all over the place, but I won't follow through with the head hit, which oh. <laughs> I, will, I will in three fences. Right? Sure. Um, that, that shot there with the person's turned around. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> in, in, in my 40-some years of fencing, call, uh, it's only happened. True. Once that I've actually hit somebody in the back of the head. Normally, I can pull that blow. Uh, typically, I don't push them to the point where they're spun around. Mm. I push them to their sideways, and I'm hitting them along right. the ear, like basically above the ear mm. in the mask. And I, I try not to hit very hard there either, because I mean, obviously, right. when we're cast off balance mm. that badly, mm. I think that our, if you will, courtesy to each other should be in uh, finishing as opposed to the action. Yeah, I, I agree completely, Cal. Yeah, and, and I, I, um, I was remiss in my explanation not being clear that what I meant to really be referring to was the elbow push and not the blow to the back of the head. <laughs> I, yeah. When I mean not being nice, I don't mean necessarily, you know, uh, uh, f finishing the blows at the back of the head. My God, no, what I uh, more meant was, um, you know, doing these full actions with the elbow push. And, and also, of course, as we like to say a lot in class, there's a difference between doing something, you know, explosively that may cause injury and doing something in, with controlled force, but in structure that will give you the result if your partner is cooperating without endangering unnecessarily the safety of your of your partner. Yeah. Um, this particular play, aside from finishing with the sword, there is no real danger. There's something you're, you're, yeah. you're spinning someone, you're throwing them off balance. Yeah. You're not like tossing them across the room. Like, uh, like on that, what the heck's that called? That new show winter Falcon or whatever, whatever it is. I mean, somebody got tossed across the room and smashed through a column oh. it's superhero stuff. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Normal people can spin each other pretty easily. Mm hmm. And I don't see any reason not to, because it's a good learning uh, moment. It's like, oh, I left my elbow hanging in the breeze, and now I'm yeah. looking the wrong way. Um, yeah. So I have no real issue with people giving each other a shove. Where I, get, I have an issue is where they're doing it to try to injure them or <laughs> yeah, yeah. The follow on of the choke and stuff like that. Yeah, if yeah. they stay strictly to, up, oh, spun you around, <clears throat> no good for you. Yeah. You know, that's all good stuff by me and, yeah. and in terms of being an instructor controlling a class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's where I stand. Yeah, no, agreed, agreed, agreed. Um, yeah, and it, it is something to, to think about and to um, and, and and to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the elbow push, elbow push, and the and the follow on. Um, so yeah, last but definitely, definitely not least, we have the perhaps the fun, the most fun for last. We have the false point play. Let's take them one at a time. Let's take the one on the time. So here we go. False point 27 VA in the Getty. Um, Connor, would you like to read this one for us? Happily. How do I sound? Perfect. Clear. Clear. Well, wonderful. This play is called the false thrust or short point. Here's how it's done. I feint a strong mezzano to the opponent's head. 
as he forms his parry, I lightly strike his blade, then immediately turn my sword to the other side, grasping it almost at mid-blade with my left hand. I can then place a quick thrust to his throat or neck. This play is better in armor than we Awesome. Okay. So, and uh, here again, here's our second, um, as it were, um, armored play in the larva section. Um, if we count the uh, one we, we looked at earlier, the, the grapple. Um, so, in armored play, insofar as one could do it in armor, right? And he actually says it here. Uh, this play is better in armor than without. Whereas, of course, in the other play we looked at in that grapple from the breaking a point, he doesn't mention that. So, um, mm -hmm. Kel? Mm. Um, the way you worded that is just strange to me. It's not that this is a play from the armor section. He's admonishing this is risky. You're better doing this when you have armor on because the chance of into incidental strike from uh, the Zugadori's blade is fairly high while you're crossing through. You've got a long traverse from right to left. Yeah, well, uh, I, and that's why uh, that's where I see him saying, yeah. and this is better in some armor. If you got armor on, you can you can more safely do this. It's not about being from the armored section. No, you're right. It's to clarify it, that. You're right. It's not from the armored section. I suppose I was being a bit rhetorical in that. You know, Fury is still talking about armor, right? He's he's talking about armor. We we wouldn't want to forget that. Um, also, um, I think who's the guy who plays? Um, who's the guy who plays the? Uh, who's the actor in um, the Karate Kid? With the headband. Ralph. Ralph Macchio. Ralph Macchio. This this guy. This is Ralph Macchio. I think he's got the he's got the Cobra Kai headband. And uh, <laughs> anyway, the, the, I don't I don't think the nose works. But anyway, um, okay. So the fall <laughs> the false point. What's going on here? So I do think there's some uh, outside of the actual play. I think there's some really interesting things um, uh, that we we can learn from this play. So let's read it. This is um, as Connor said. This is the play called the False Thrust. I faint a strong Mezzano to the opponent's head. I'm going to try and get through this um, without talking about feints and provocations and things. That's another, that's a whole other day and uh, battle. Um, hmm. Fury says, I faint a strong Mezzano to the opponent's head. As he forms his parry, I lightly strike his blade and then immediately turn my sword over to the other side grasping it almost at mid blade with my left hand okay so he so he faints a strong mezzano whatever that means to the opponent's head and as the opponent forms the parry to that blow but before the parry touches the scholar's sword the scholar decides to meet that parry lightly and then immediately turn his sword over to the other side so if we see the final picture here, he's we see we see this picture after the sword's been turned over. So we have to imagine the scholar having throw having fainted a what is the what is the word? A strong Mezzano. mezzano. Uh what's the Italian here? Um da, 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 diro mo, yo, uh, grande forza. No, is that with grand Cum grande forza, it means with great strength. With great strength, yeah. I think that's the right place. So, um... This so, is a sales job. That's, uh, that's, selling, that's you're, right. You're selling this, this uh, hammer blow from the right shoulder to uh, the middle of the guy's head. And, you know, maybe if you, if you stepped a little bit outside off the line and tried to wind... Well, you know, pound one round in. The Germans have a, a version of this to both sides. Um, mm -hmm. This particular one, where you cast the blow, like you got to sell it. You got to be sincere in your vision, uh, your vis mm -hmm. uh, how your you look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to make that sale because if you don't make the sale, they're not going to try to strongly bind. They'll, they may leave. Uh, because when mm -hmm. they see the big windup mm -hmm. coming, but also if they're relatively well trained, mm -hmm. they may just go, oh, I can take that blow and then uh, we'll wrestle. You know, mm -hmm. exactly. a lot of things go through people's heads before you put your sword through their face. Mm. Yeah. So, so what's fascinating about this play is that um, we see Fury specifically suggest 
some kind of sales salesmanship, right? And I don't think we've I don't think we've really Dagger. seen that before. Dagger. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe no, Dagger. Maybe. Yeah. Um, the flick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. The flick and the, the, the maybe the fish, maybe and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've we've seen it. We've seen something analogous uh, in other places, I suppose. But certainly, I I, I don't think with the sword, uh, at least as far as I can oh, no. remember. No, no. And so so so, so that's so that's fascinating because we're forced to ask ourselves then, what is it? What is this sale? What the hell is he talking about? Because he didn't give us, he, he doesn't give us any instructions. Okay, so because he doesn't give us any instructions, again we're forced just to speculate um, according to our reason and our, our knowledge of what we're doing here. And I, I think conventional wisdom on this, and this has been the case every, you know, every time I've seen somebody demonstrate this at Adama, it's been with the same basic theory in mind, is that what constitutes selling this strong mezzano here in technical terms is beginning to throw a mezzano with as much body indication that it's going to be strong as you can muster and there's a there's a there's a lot of little things that can help show that but you know, uh, dropping the shoulder, rising up, he, uh, taking in a big audible breath, you know, maybe maybe um, letting the point kind of kick back a teeny bit because you're kind of to make it look like you're winding up and stuff like that. Doing a whole bunch of cues, right? Whilst not overselling it, of course, but doing a whole bunch of cues to provide visual stimuli to your enemy to help them make a mistake. And the mistake you're trying to get them to make is the, you want them to believe that they know in reality what they're about to touch, right? You want, you want them to, to make the mistake saying, I know this is going to be a strong blow. So here's my defense against this strong blow, right? Now, do they have to make that mistake? Of course not, right? You're, you're, just, you're, you're, you're giving them the opportunity to do it. But what this salesmanship is, you know, beyond this actual play, it's visual cues that encourage your enemy to make an assumption that you can then play off of. All right. And in the assumption being made in this case, like I said, is the, the assumption that the enemy has to rush to defend a strong mezzano uh, uh, blow. And the key, but the key part of this, in my view anyway, is what comes after. It's not the assumption. It's this line. I lightly strike his blade. Then immediately turn my sword to the other side. I find this critical because um, the best lies have truth in them. Right? That's a general life lesson. <laughs> that the, the most convincing lies have, have, have truth in them. But in this case, if you never engaged their sword and they were paying attention, they would know you're lying. Because a strong mezzano is going to create an engagement. It's going to give a touch. So they're expecting a touch. And you say, okay, you're expecting a touch and you're expecting it to be strong. I'm going to charge up this huge mezzano, throw it at you like it's a huge mezzano, but because I have control, ting, just touch it. And in the space that I hope you're, confusing, uh, you're confused in, when you're expecting the heavy blow, but you only get a touch, in the space where you go, huh? I flip the sword around, and now I'm in a position, which is this, which is very difficult for you to react to properly. Okay? So um, that's the that's the broad sort of logic of doing this particular play, right? You get in them, you're encouraging them to make a mistake with as in as many ways as you can, including adding some truth to the lie, right? Um, and if you don't add truth to that lie, if you're just ha you know doing things like hand pumping or doing things that are wholly visual, that will probably fool. Uh, newer fencers, but it won't experienced ones because they know 
they know not to buy those sorts of things anymore. They need some truth, uh, some truth to it. Um, so, so yeah, so this is a really, really cool play, um, for, for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, one after is yeah. even better. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, uh, let's go to that one. And, and I'll preface it by saying, I've seen this play done, this next play we're going to look at. I've seen this play done successfully, specifically when the lie had no truth. Sorry, a quick question uh, mm -hmm. before the next one. What is the point of turning the sword around again? Ah, so, okay, so the point of turning the sword over is to basically exclude this whole side, okay? You, you, um, the, the act of giving the strong Metsano, what you're hoping to do is you're hoping to pull the enemy's sword a little bit to their left, off the center line, away from the center line, right? Because they're trying to prepare and meet this huge Metsano, which if they don't resist, it's going to blow through the center line. So you, you, you charge it up, you throw it, you give a little tick to make sure he knows you're there, but then you, you, you jump over. And once you've jumped over like this, when you're in this position, you have claimed the center line and you have your strong on their middle, uh, in this picture anyway, and your point in their face. And it's very, very difficult to turn this around for Ralph Macchio. Very, very, very difficult, if if impossible, right? If if you've got to this point, right? If this action has, has completed. So why have you turned the sword around? You've turned the sword around and remained in contact, mind you, in order to assure yourself that you know where his sword is, his sword can't do shit to you, and you have him where you want him. And again, this is only basically for Mitsanos from the left, right? Or Actually, it... that's a good that's a good question. I, I I've principally experienced this from Mitsanos from the left, but I, you might be able to do it in the opposite way. I don't know. I've never tried it. Well, I've tried. Change hands. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's um, true. this particular play, I have never continued in contact with the Zugadori sword. Uh, once you do your ting off of it, and mm -hmm. and spin the sword around 300 degrees 360 mm. degrees um, you regain his blade but the you have to leave his blade to get to the other side of it you do yes no I, I, you do yeah for, for sure and i achieving contact again um would be i guess would be my stylistic preference but it's not strictly necessary as long as you're excluding the side um you, you're, you're you're probably fine right um yeah and of course, you, if you're in armor, then you're uh, further immune to any incidentals that 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 may come. So, does that answer your question, uh, Alex? Yep. Great. 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 Okay. So uh, now we're at the uh, the next play, the fall one, and it's the only countermaster in the Largo section, which is very curious. Uh, very, very curious indeed. Twenty-seven VB. Um, dip, dip, dip. Uh, Graham, would you like to read the text for us? Sure. Uh, this is the second counter to the play we just saw. No, sorry, second counter. This is the counter to the play we just saw, i.e. the false thrust or short point. When the student strikes my blade and circles his sword around mine, I turn mine around his in the same manner, while with an offline pass, I find the opponent's uncovered side. I can then put a thrust in his face. The counter is good both in and out of armor. Awesome. Thank you very much, Graham. So the counter to this play is essentially to do this, to do something very similar to the uh, a right back to the scholar as the countermaster. Um, this this counter ca uh, can work perfectly well after that little touch, but it works even better without the touch. Because um, paradoxically, the uh, the lack of touch is more of a clue to this person, uh, in my view anyway, that the that the the sword's coming around than the actual touch is. But but that's a you know that's my view. Regardless, if you're paying attention, um, this counter is possible, right? This um this the selling play is not uh, impossible to counter in any way. 
Um, and as the sword is coming around, even if it's coming around quickly, you still have time to do this. You can grab the sword with your offhand and resist the blade coming around and then put the point in their face. And in here, we're ending in a poster that's very similar to um, Short Serpent. Similar. Yeah, Short Serpent from the from the um, the sword and two hand section. But in this case, it's Short Serpent that kind of extended into the into the guy's head. Um, yeah. Uh, there's also an interesting thing about this play. I've seen two different ways of doing it. Um, or I've seen two preferences of how to how to end with this one. I've seen some people favor uh, with this this sword suppression in sort of third, but I have seen others do it in prime, which is less common though. It's the way we used to do it. Yeah, and until then, we really looked it over. Right, and 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 just just for your 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 image, um, uh, your your. Um, to put an image in your mind what i mean in prime what i mean is end that play instead of with the sword in third here instead of here end the play mirrored mirrored in uh here. high serpent here more mm. more in high more in high serpent but of course mm. ex ex extended in um extended in in the engagement yeah, I'm not going with you there, buddy. Right, but um, I'm not saying I don't have a particular preference, but I've seen it. I've seen it done done both ways. Um, but obviously, people will have their will have their preferences. But yeah, it's basically right. just to, just to re to, to counter the 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 enemy's action here with something that's pretty much the same or that's very similar. I, I'm not fully sure I understand where their sword is in this scenario. Is it still threatening you? So yeah, and it's a little messy in this image. Um, let me let me zoom in on it. This image just actually isn't great to showing the blade engagements. I, I think here, um, it looks like in the image that their sword is like slipped under and is actually touching the arm of the scholar. If these guys were in armor, then that wouldn't matter at all, right? That would be utterly incidental, probably not not that important. But more often than not, when we do this play. We're going to end up with their sword um, on our true edge here, so it's going to be really, it's going to be really suppressing the blade with the point in their face. Um, Sean Sean Hayes has a decent video on this, I think. Last time I I checked, I, I should have I should have got it uh, for this for this session, but whatever. Yeah, I'm gonna try to try to cut it short because he rambles and rambles and rambles and just watch this thing for 10 minutes 10 minutes before he actually does the play uh, well it's a good um, thing he'll never okay. watch this because it's this is recorded um no. yeah uh, if you could go back there please if yep. you don't mind absolutely oh to okay. the to the high-res image uh, yeah okay sorry um, sorry this particular configuration um where you end up uh over top of their sword with your left arm mm. actually does happen although it, sure. it's better in armor obviously mm. but uh, it's something that you can put a lot of pressure on because you've got your sword edge cutting into the back of the zugadori's left wrist so there's not going to be a lot of pressure under your forearm mm. when you're pressing this thing down and mm. you have to press it down to get the point back on line to his face as you see the points at his forehead that's not a place you want to thrust somebody because if it bounces off, you've wasted and overcommitted yourself. This this play, uh, going back to something you said about not tinging off the blade or mm. not selling it properly. Yes, not selling it properly, mm. but being very obvious in that you're not going to follow through with the Mezzano is the clue to jump on top of this guy's blade because mm. he hasn't got any real momentum mm. uh, coming forward. He's trying to get his point online. And as you see, he's missed the shoulder. So the contramaster here has stepped a little inside as this guy did his big long arc from the right to the left. And you will mm -hmm. come down on top of the sword, possibly just as he grabs it or just after he grabs possibly, it with, possibly. Mm -hmm. with his hand. But mm -hmm. as you see, the mm -hmm. sword is on his wrist. He's not going to, the Zugadori is not going to be able to generate much energy, not, not certainly not enough cut through a linen gambeson but on top of that 
the countermaster is inside the point. This is something a That's lot right. of people miss. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. The, the master is inside the point here. So, um, yeah, this sword is is of no it, it's, serious threat. Yeah, it's not really that 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 threatening right now. Uh, yeah, plus their grip is probably super shit. They got their the points in their face. This this guy has the tempo now. The countermaster. Yeah. Yeah. So this is and bad that news pass best. forward with a that pass mm -hmm. forward with the left leg generates an enormous amount. Oh yeah. Of oh yeah. Very very strong. Very strong. This this play here is one you don't want to be caught in, right? The, oh, one man. of the one of the problems with this play, one of the well, one of the one of the weaknesses, right? Every play has their weakness. One of the weaknesses of this one is getting caught in the transition, coming around, right? You have to make sure you do it. <laughs> you get it. You get it done, <laughs> or you're in trouble. Um, um, yeah. uh, it's Beatty mm -hmm. I've yes, Beatty. put a couple of uh, links to some videos oh. with examples of some of these plays. Oh, that is that is true. Look at that. Um, yeah, actually, this video, these videos do have some. All right. So seeing as we're seeing as we're getting to the end of the wrestling or the wrestling, the Largo section. Um, so let's take a moment to pause here and uh, well, let's read the conclusion before I, we say anything final. Let's read the conclusion. I'll read the conclusion here. So at the end of the Largo section, we have 27 VC. And it says, here ends the play of the wide, uh, here, blah, blah, blah. here ends the wide play of the sword in two hands. These 20 plays are all linked and have remedies and counters, both from Mindrito and the reverso side, counter thrusts and counter cuts to each action with breaks, parries, strikes, and binds. These are all things that can be understood very easily. Okay. So the interesting thing about this little bookend paragraph here is that, you know, there's always an open question in manuscript studies as to if we're missing anything. Or if the manuscript that we're looking at is unbeknownst to us some kind of copy of something that came before. We're and missing a couple pages. Ex exactly. Now, what this little paragraph helps us understand is that um, I think I checked this out. I think it's all checked out last time I looked. There are twenty plays. You know, they they do show these things, and this this here fits the description of the Largo section we just saw, which can put our mind at ease a little bit about if we think maybe we're missing something like Fiore didn't include something or maybe this is a copy of 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 something um that you know maybe the, in the original Fiore had 30 plays right now it's possible that that the, the original did have 30 plays and then when this was copied this was altered as well you know what i mean but it's unlikely right so this is interesting evidence to suggest that we do have uh, the largo section complete um, in the way that it seems. Um, so that's a bit more of an academic -y point, but it's interesting nonetheless. Um, okay, so um, Largo. That's the Largo section. We made it all the way through. Um, so does anybody have any questions or thoughts that they'd like to share about the Largo section now that we've completed it? We're about to move on to Stretto. I have one small comment if nobody else has anything to say. Please, Cal, go ahead. Largo is where you win. Stretto is where you survive. Yeah. People that think all that, that they're equal, they clearly misunderstand this or have mm. absolutely excessive views of their own ability and prowess at grappling. Because mm. uh, if you leave a sword fight to, to wrestle, you miss the you missed something really important, and that's the sword play. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, when you have to wrestle, when you're forced to enter, that's because something hasn't gone your way. Uh, I, I like agree with that a heard, thousand percent. I've seen arguments. Yeah. I've seen arguments online where people say, "Oh, I I prefer to enter straddle and do this mm -hmm. and that," and I know that person's an idiot just by listening mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I think you're right. And we are going to move on to Stretto, of course, very shortly. So that's, um, 
you know, we're going to be thinking about Largo the whole way through while we're in Stretto. But one thing I'll, I'll say in this class, and I'm sure I'll say it in the next bunch of Stretto classes we do, it's my view that you earn your right to play at Largo by knowing your Stretto. So if, if you're shit at Stretto, then people are going to push in on you and slap you around. If you want to be at Largo, which is where ideally you want to be in swordsmanship, then you have to be, you have to at least have some level of competence in Stretto such that you can't be blown over um, like a, a leaf in the, in the, in the breeze. And so people will consent. And that's a different story to, to than choosing Largo. to go there. Absolutely. Absolutely it is. And of course, you know, uh, if it's for all the marbles, you know, and you choose to go to Stretto and that, you know, helps you survive, well then fine, whatever, right? But again, not every time we fence is for all the marbles, right? We're What we're doing here at Emma yeah. is learning excellent swordsmanship, uh, not pretending like every time we fight, we're fighting uh, a duel to the death. Um, and so I, I couldn't agree more with that, Kel, that Largo is where we want to be. I boiled it down yeah. uh, that way after many discussions with other people who said, you know, things similar to that. And I really liked it as a, as a short mnemonic, the same way that, you know, cuts break, thrust, thrust, break, cut, all that mm. sort of stuff. Um, having the opportunity to uh, stay in sword play is always going to be better than being so close that you're wrestling. Things can go horribly wrong when you're that close, whereas at... Uh, and the length of the blades, you get a lot less chance of terribly going wrong, like really yeah. terribly going wrong. Yeah, and you have you have more time to to resolve your own fuck ups. Sure. Right, because you know distance equals time, right? And yeah. if you're you know you you do have the the possibility of correcting errors that you make because nobody's perfect, right? Only the ideal master is perfect, but the ideal master, of course, doesn't exist. So if you're going to make mistakes and you are, uh, you know, and you're f fighting with sharps, it makes sense to fight in the most generous environment for you, you know, yeah. uh, that, okay. you, that, that you can. Let's, let's go on with those uh, videos that uh, Andrew brought up. Yeah, a BD. Yeah. So right. let's let's watch this one. This this has a little bit of a compilation of um, of of. Uh, of Fury's moves. This is actually one of my favorite videos of all time. If I ever need to get pumped up about Fury, usually I watch this video. Um, but it's got some uh, neat little comp uh, compilation of, of things in it um, that we can uh, just take a look at. And I think a lot of these are Largo plays. So let's <laughs> let's take a look. If any of you haven't watched this video already, I, I, I hope mo all of you have. <laughs> but if you haven't watched it, uh, please do. It's a, absolutely excellent. Oh, he did the thing. Oh, do you see the thing? He did the thing. I totally forgot that was in here. All right, let's watch that yeah. again. So that... Yeah, can we watch that in slow motion? Yeah, yeah. Let's... um. Uh, how do I do that? Settings. Play... Ooh, not quality. Settings, playback speed. Uh, zero 05. Three quarter. All right, yeah, let's try zero 05. All right. There you go. So that's that's one version of that play that we were describing uh, describing earlier. Yeah, the play the player in the green uh, tunic doesn't flinch as much as I would expect someone to no. if they knew the sword was coming up at their face. Yeah, 
Um, in the way we described, we described it, him as coming up uh, in something something like a, a breve or, or something like that. But he he instead comes up to a finestra in the, in that case. But it did, it didn't matter. Um, anyway. Cool. Isn't that a neat little comp, uh, a compilation? Yeah, they did a great job. Yeah, these guys, these guys are great. These are the best Fury videos. Um, uh, I mean, now, these these are the best like kind of cinematic -y Fury videos out there. Some of the things I they do I disagree with, but that's the case with everyone, so you can't fault them for that. They're, these are great though. These these guys. Yeah. Um, they're they're really really top notch. Um, okay, so yeah, that's it. Largo is where you want to be. There's the conclusion. Largo is where you want to be if you can get there. Um, and it's also, you know, because it's the place you want to be, it's also extremely difficult to get good at being there. Right. Um, you know, I'm, I'm definitely one of those people that's, um, constantly overcritical of their own, um, of their own fencing. And one of the things that, um, I've always, I've never forgotten Brian saying to me, was you know he came up to me one day when i was kind of bummed out that i was you know shitting the bed in a fight night or something and um he said something to the effect of you know what's the problem what's going on i'm like ah oh, you know i'm not doing well and he said w why would you do well and i'm like well you know because i i know what to do and i'm trying to do it but it's not working and he's like well you know what do you mean it's not working you mean the super difficult complicated thing is not working against all the people that are better than you and i'm like yeah so you're pissed off that you're not. Um, <laughs> so you're pissed off that be, that even though you're not very good, the complicated things you're trying to do against people who are better than you aren't working. Well, I guess so. So stop being such an arrogant asshole. He says, just train, right? Just train, and be you know be be kind to yourself. Just because all of these complicated things and techniques and concepts just because they're not working for you doesn't mean anything about your skill or the nature of the art. The only thing it means is that the art is complex and ultimately it, in order to gain a serious competency in it, it takes a lifetime of, of practice. There's no two ways about it. It's a physical craft, like anything else, like leatherworking, like bricklaying, like music, like, like anything else. And you can't expect things to go well, uh, all the time even when you're an expert there's tons of things to uh, uh, to, uh, to learn and always to improve so be at largo accept the fact that you're going to suck at it and just train it and you'll you'll get better and better and with that said let's punch somebody in the face <clears throat> stretto jogo stretto all That's right sorry. I found the coolest little clip this afternoon of mm. a, a whiteback, silverback gorilla in a zoo being mm -hmm. annoyed with, uh, you know, an adolescent being too close to him or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, the silverback literally straight hands him in the face. <laughs> <laughs> it was like what the Clooney's would That's punch funny. somebody in every which way but loose. It was just crack. And <laughs> the adolescent, of course, didn't take it well. Uh -huh. That's... You know, once he picked his ass up off the ground and kind of went yeah. over, sat in the corner, and went, "Oh, okay." That's funny. Okay. Yeah, but it was it was one of those moments of, Ack. <laughs> and that happens that fast. But yeah, I, I can't imagine being punched by an eight hundred pound gorilla. Would you know, like straight iron by an eight hundred pound gorilla would be a real cool thing. I would hurt like a bugger. <laughs> yeah, you know, I uh, I couldn't imagine being punched by Aldo, and then it happened. And, you know, now I never want to ever yeah. happen again. <laughs> no, no, he just had a punch. I, I don't remember any of the times that I've been punched by Aldo. <laughs> that's right, that's right. They're kind of reset, the reset so moments, less. aren't they? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, they're, they're even less pleasant than they seem. <laughs> um, well, yeah, and, no strong yeah. selling point. No, no, they no, they don't. Um, all right, so, so we're starting Stretto today. 
Um, I guess it is already 9.30, so this will serve as a little introduction to Stretto. We'll look at the first play and in, in things, and we'll get our um, we'll get situated. So, um, like I said at the beginning of this uh, of this treatment here with Largo and Stretto, I'm not really going to dwell on the you know the debate between what really is Largo and Stretto or whatever, um, or any of this you know any of those kinds of questions. It's sufficient for us um, for our examination to understand what Largo and Stretto uh, are in their uh, you know broad obvious context, right? Largo is loose play, wide play constrained, uh, unconstrained play, play at the tip or the middle of the sword where um, the, you know, the principal threat and defense is the length of the blade, right? With postus being used at their full extension. And though in the Largo section, there are occasionally entries, as we just saw, by and large, the Largo section seems to be dealing with, at least in my reading, um, exchanges and um, breaking a point with thrusting and also um, uh, you know single time and uh, double time remedies against cuts right oblique engagements and, and beats so very lively sprightly play um, avoiding near occasions of uh, blade grabs right which necessitates that your blades are moving all the time not resting in the center that's largo Stretto is another beast. Stretto is another beast. Stretto is the close play, the short play, the constrained play. And colloquially speaking, we imagine most grappling that occurs when swords are in hand as being some form of Stretto. And even more broadly, Stretto is stuff that happens close up, right? Entries that happen close up. And broadly speaking, what we're going to see in the Stretto section is just that, is different kinds of entries that we can do when we're close to the enemy. Um, in the, the Stretto section, I'm going to I'm going to advocate for one way of trying to organize these plays in your mind. Um, but uh, and this is the way that I learned from uh, from Bo Brock, free scholar Bo Brock, who is the uh, free scholar of the Ottawa school. And when I was training with him during his f free scholar test uh, buildup, he, he kind of came up with this and I've, I've liked it ever since. But there's many ways, of course, to organize the material in Fury. And the point that uh, the point is for you to understand it and remember it such that you can do it on the floor. So however you organize these plays, and there are a good number, you want to organize them in a way that results in you doing them on the floor, remembering to do them when you're fencing at full speed. Uh, as just a memorization exercise, that's that's useless, right? Um, so, um, lots of plays in Stretto. Let's read the introduction and then the first play. So, Badoo. Introduction to Stretto. Um, Amber, would you like to read the text here? We will now start the close play of the sword in two hands. We will see every kind of parry, strike, bind, dislocation, grapple, disarm, and throw. We will also see the remedies and the counters to each action needed to attack and defend. Thank you, Amber. Okay, so parries, strikes, binds, dislocations, grapples, disarms, and throws. Hmm, that sounds similar. I wonder where we saw that before. Hmm. Oh, the Dagger Masters, they're back! Those bastards! We thought we left them behind. Disarms, breaks, keys, and throws. We're going to see them all in the Strato section. Along with um, parries, and, parries and strikes. Right. Um, interestingly, he didn't even leave out strikes. Although there isn't any obvious... Um, you know, striking with the hands, per se, uh, here. Although actually, that may not be true. But there, there is immediately plays with the striking with the pommel. So effectively, we can consider ourselves back to what, um, back to examining all the things that we we've learned already, through the whole wrestling section and the whole dagger section and all the shit that we saw there. Now we're going to apply it to the sword. 
So that's what we're in store for. We okay. get to take advantage of our deep knowledge of Abrazade. That's right. That's right. And thank goodness, right? We don't have to imagine anything out of whole cloth here. We're going back to something that we um, we already know. In many ways, Largo is the more um, puzzling section. If you're, of course, reading the book from... Outlier. Yeah, it's more of an outlier because he doesn't really say too much about all of the the things that are involved in it before we get there. Right. Whereas Stretto, we start off with that bizarre dagger and, you know, that's a huge part of the book. So Stretto, we're kind of back in familiar ground almost. Except we have a big fuck off sword instead of a, a dagger. Uh, Folio 28 R.A. This is the first master of Stretto. Uh, Alex, would you like to read the text for us? I, um, the issue is resolved. Or oh, that's right. I forgot about that. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry, man. I apologize. <laughs> I apologize. We'll get you to read lots next week. I, I, I swear. I'll read it. Uh, oh, Kel, excellent. Please okay. do. We've crossed our swords. This is the crossing from which we can make all the plays that follow. Both of us could perform each of them. These plays will follow one another, as I've explained above. Thank you, Kel. All right. So, Stretto, right? Before we started the Largo section, we took a moment to sketch out, to sketch a border around what the nature of Largo is, what it seemed like we were dealing with, with um, Largo plays, what was involved, what was important, etc. We're going to try and do the same for Stretto. Um, and I think this play, even though there's not a lot of information here, it's not a lot of words here, this text to me gives us our context or at least the context that we possibly lacked without this text we, so we are as we just said we already know we're going to be doing abazari and dagger stuff and we we've done a ton of that shit already so in that sense there shouldn't be that much that's super surprising or new uh, although of course we do have a sword in our hand so what else is there right what else is there and there's this line here where Fiore says, both of us could perform each of them. Okay. Now, I'm not going to read too much into this right now for this audience. But what this line, I think, at a minimum tells us is that when we're in a situation like this, if there isn't a clear leader or follower, then the first actor gets to be the leader okay so it is possible and we have seen many situations in the wrestling and dagger section where we're in something that looks like stretto um but the person who sort of the person who initiated stretto is the leader right so the person who you know gave the dagger attack i guess is entering into something like stretto and the forcing of defense and etc cetera, etc cetera, right with swords, the interesting thing about swords is swords have the possibility of playing at the tips or playing closer. And swords have a problem that if the engagement and the distance between two um, fencers gets too close and the engagement on the sword gets too shallow, it becomes difficult for either of the swordsmen to leave and get back to Largo. Not impossible, but it becomes extremely difficult. Because remember, risky. distance equals time. Exactly, risky. So if the closer you are, the less time you have to, to react to things. And if you're super close and you're trying to make distance, you're trying to leave, then, you know, you're adding space in. You, you're, you're leaving the engagement while the enemy can still follow you. They still have, they have a whole length of their blade. To, to, to use to offend you while you're trying to leave. And as if you don't leave exactly correct, that blade could catch you while you're leaving, right? And so because of that risk, sometimes it, you run into a situation in swordsmanship where you're playing at Largo and things are fine. You run into a situation where you find yourself unable to leave or rather you find the, the risk of leaving unpalatable. And that leaves you in a position where there's only one way to go, and that's in. 
and if both people are in that position, which they often are in this in the in these cases, that results in um, this kind of stretto situation where both people can do either of these plays. Both of us could perform each of them, and. I just want to stress this, I guess, a little bit more. This is notably absent in the Largo section. And why I think this is notably absent is because in Largo, we were typically dealing with clear situations of leader follower, right? Someone was initiating, someone was following. And when, when the follower, when the defender performed their play, they reversed the tempo. So then they were leading, right? There was never, there was never a time when the tempo evened out. There was never a time when when either person could do either thing. But in Stretto, and this is often the case in wrestling and in dagger, um, in, in just in general, if ever there's not a clear momentum in the action, then both people can do something, right? And this, happen this happens all the time because counters are relatively, you know, counters in wrestling are much easier to perform. And in dagger, they're, they're difficult, but, you know, it's still somewhat wrestling, right? In, in wrestling, to counter something, all you have to do is kind of give it the opposite of force. And, you know, um, y you learn this wrestling with your siblings when you're f four years old. They try to pull you up and you pull yourself down. They try and pull you left and you yank yourself right. You know, and that su suffices to kind of keep things rather even in, um, in wrestling. But the point is, is that in this situation, in Stretto, we do have swords, right? And so it's not as if we're just wrestling. We're wrestling with a sword that if we're clever and well-trained, we can bring the sword back into play, right? So we're not just wrestling. But we're in a situation in which um, entering into some kind of... Um, some kind of uh, Abrazari situation could be beneficial for us. Okay, so in this sense, Stretto is um, significantly different from Largo. It's a different beast. All right, and um, to add to that, of course, is Kel's observation, uh, which again, which I agree with a thousand percent, is that because it's closer, be there is therefore less time. There's less time for you to think. There's less time for you to make mistakes and recover. We're more like Dagger than we've ever been since we left Dagger, right? Um, so uh, we have to... So th th the situation we're, we're looking at with Stretto, similar to Dagger, is a situation with tons of different plays that we need to get a handle on. We need to get an intuitive grasp of what, what's on offer in Stretto. So that when it happens, we don't really think about it too much. We just do the things, right? It's not sufficient to have a th to have. Uh, I don't know how many dagger plays there are. Ninety dagger plays kicking around your head, in order to do the you know in order to make your defenses uh, with dagger. You have to internalize that stuff and try and break it down and simplify it for yourself, so you're not rolodexing between ninety plays every time you have to make a defense. You're doing one or two that work. And so similar with Stretto, right? There's lots of things you could do, but because you have no time and uh, you can't really make mistakes, you want to try and, you know, uh, learn it, but shrink that information down to something that's manageable and that you can use reflexively, uh, habitually, right? So you don't have to think too much. So that's what we're, um, that's what I would say we're looking at uh, observing here with the Stratos section. Um, with respect to moves and things that we do, um, there's a, a lot of stuff at the beginning involves um, doing entries or plays with the sword. There's an entry onto the hilt. There's a couple pommel strikes to begin. We have some entries onto the hilt um, in various different ways. We've seen these in, uh, we've seen a couple entries onto the um, the the, um, the hilt of the cross in the sword one hand section. Then we have some deeper entries. We have a double middle key here, which is always a, a crowd pleaser. It's always really nice. Um, we have a couple throws. We have some elbow push like things and some things which you can try to get around somebody, get to their back. 
and then we have a bunch of disarms. We have actually five or so disarms in here, I think. Five or six disarms. Um, so if we really compare it to the dagger material, I, I, I think in the wrestling material, it's really nothing is all that surprising. But the problem is, is that some of it is actually difficult to do. <laughs> like the, the wielding the sword effectively uh, while in Stretto is is hard. It's not intuitive for us uh, for us at all. And and I say that as someone who um, has very often cast aside the sword in Stretto because they just they just can't handle it, right? Uh, you know they you know other, I find myself oftentimes in the past when I've been put into a strato situation, especially when striking and wrestling is at the top of my mind, I'll often cast aside my sword and switch directly to my wrestling and striking roll the decks because that's what's bubbling up at the top of my brain. But I know that though this is all material that is active here, strato with a sword is strato with a sword, right? And if you can keep your sword, and perform these straddle plays, do it. And that, I to me, I think that's a far more competent and more excellent way of handling these sort of straddle situations than just dropping your sword and starting to wrestle and, you know, punch somebody, right? It's always better. It's always better to play with the sword if you have a sword. Right. And to yeah. punch. Uh, you're, you're going to be able to do more damage with the multiple... Yeah. facets of the sword yeah. than you could possibly do with your hand. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, not least, the, uh, you know, casting aside the sword is only advantageous in a very few scenarios. Specifically, if he's the only person you're fighting. You know, maybe you could get away with it. Right? But if, there's, if you're in a multiple opponent situation, or you're in any kind of, you know, chaotic situation like a battlefield or a civil disturbance or anything like that, then casting aside your sword for any reason seems to be very foolish, uh, uh, or or rather would seem would seem to be not ideal, right? If you could help it. So, I just wanted to kind of bookend my little description here with that. As someone who has often done that in the past, um, you know, I'm I'm always reminding myself that the strato section seems to be about strato with sword with the sword and wrestling at the sword yeah at the sword so so yeah that's what we're we're um, we're looking forward to do you have anything to add there uh kel um no it's it, it, it's just uh to repeat two things one try to stay in in largo if you can possibly do it uh Mistretto has many many more risks and secondly um, whoever gets there, and this is a, a quote from an American Civil War general. Mm. Whoever gets there, the first is with the mostest. Yeah, that's right. That's that is the admonition yeah. of uh, what Fiore says of what I can do, he can also do. Uh, because you know, depending on who does it fast, you're probably going to be better off than who does it hard. Because yeah. hard, unless you're incredibly strong. Uh, or significantly stronger than your playmate. Uh, hard is a waste of energy and it telegraphs. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, uh, subtlety, lightness of feet, that sort of stuff can make a huge difference in strato. Whereas power, not so much. Timing, being swift with the hands. Mm -hmm. uh, rest, uh, I think the Italian for is prestesa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, you know, and, and even further to that, you know, uh, God forbid you get into a martial arts situation where the person who wins is going to be the person who's firstest with the mostest. Mm -hmm. Like, like fuck that. Like, like Largo is so much more even in comparison. You know, at least if you are weaker, right? If you are weaker, and if you are less trained, Largo is more even. Because yeah, at more least, tools your, as, yeah, uh, more tools to your hand. Yeah, you you at least have you know if you have basic knowledge of of uh, single time uh, remedies and double time remedies, you know you have a chance of if you stick to your basics. There's nothing wrong or deficient about the basics 
in Largo. And that's, that's, that's another something that I think is, is worth mentioning. You know, uh, it's included with practicing this stuff. St a lot of these straddle plays are, um, they're not necessarily complicated, but they're difficult to do in the, in the tempo, in the right tempo at full speed, right? Very difficult to, to, to pull off. Um, the lar the Largo stuff that we do all the time and the boring repetition that we do in class, it constitutes, or at least it's in my opinion, it constitutes excellent fencing. Just doing the regular stuff well, making basic covers, doing oblique and uh, obliques and beats, keeping your distance and your time about you, not doing anything special or interesting constitutes excellent fencing, as long as you don't get hit, right? Making good decisions, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? It doesn't have to be Errol Flynn-esque in Largo to be good, right? And I think that's something that people struggle with with Largo because they feel like it has to be has they feel like it has to have some sort of visible excellence in order to count as being being good but I honestly think that's a that's a problem with expectations you know stretto doing a stretto well takes takes excellence right it really does it takes a lot of um, a lot of practice and training to do it well at full speed Largo you can get by with the basics if you attend to them and it's and that's fine right um and in that way largo is clearly i would say di a different beast to stretto right um you know if you have the basics you can fight fencers who are way more experienced than you and not be overwhelmed uh too much whereas if you were to say you know if you were a new recruit or sorry a new scholar and you're going to jump into stretto with someone <laughs> You're gonna get your, you get your ass munched. Like you, you, you're gonna get, you get thrown around, right? That is not a recipe for success. But new scholars do hit advanced students all the time in Largo, all the time, right? This, the success rate, not having, I suppose, the, done the statistics, but the success rate of new scholars and new, you know, students at full speed hitting advanced students in Largo far exceeds those succeeding at stretto with the advanced students far succeeds um, not least because all the advanced students are not advanced enough that they don't make m mistakes constantly or rather i'll speak for myself even me who's been doing this 14 15 years now i make mistakes constantly in largo right <laughs> constantly so if we just stay at largo there's a good great chance i'll fuck up and you'll hit me right if we go to stretto though i i'd probably feel more comfortable because of my experience right so again to extra emphasize as we move into this strato discussion largo is the place you want to be and for good reason for good reason but if you if you're visibly poor at strato if you're visibly you know um uh you know people like people who are in largo constantly running away from an engagement right never giving forward pressure on an engagement always yeah r always running away as someone who used to d i did that in largo for my first you know five six seven years of fencing easy right i was well known for that fleeing the engagement counter punching things like that that makes people want to bring you to stretto because even if um because it, it, it looks like you're so unwilling to go to stretto that you'll do anything no matter how silly to avoid it Right. And that can really put you in a corner. But if you fence in Largo in a way where you're visibly not afraid to go to Stretto, you hold your own, you're giving counter pressure, you're not always running away. If you do that, you're you're you have a much more difficult you present a much more difficult Largo challenge to your opponent than someone who's always on the back pedal all the time. Um, you know, I've seen the I've seen the teachers at Emma chase down people who backpedal. I've seen them chase them down like dogs, right? Because once, you know, it's it's that easy to do. Um, but of course, in order to stand your ground at Largo, um, you need to actually have some stretter available, right? You need to have something to, to, to draw on. So if you're somebody who likes Largo, like I do, then one of the best ways to get to do Largo a lot is to train a lot of stretto. And I know that sounds counterintuitive, but it's just the truth, at least in far as my experience goes. I don't know if you'd agree with that, Kel. No. All right. <laughs> well, Kel has a different <laughs> Kel has a different view. 
Um, but let's let me say let me say let me say it like this. This is much less controversial. Learning Strato is good for you. <laughs> oh yeah. There you go. <laughs> um, my my take on that is not to be contrary, but uh, uh -huh. you you should learn all of the material sure. you should be at least be exposed to all the material and you'll you'll um, gravitate towards certain things like, right like uh, david ito with his snapshots right sure uh, that that kind of stuff and his ability to you know backpedal out of the way which is quite frankly a mere shadow of what guy winter can accomplish he's like a french pain battle tank. he's got five <laughs> reverse gears and two forward oh, he man. is so good at getting out of the fight and i don't mean it in, in, in cow he, he has really clear um, uh, two-fold mind. Very, very clear. And That's he's good. an excellent fencer. Uh, it's just he, he also knows that uh, anytime he plays with one of us from Emma, he's going to get wrestled down to the ground if he comes too close. So he will do everything he can to avoid Stretto, which he knows. He knows the material. Hmm. But he does, he knows that he doesn't know it as well as we teach it. Like we emphasize it far more than than that he does in his uh, run of schools. And he's the first to admit it. He's a very honest hmm. fellow. Hmm. Yeah. So you know, Strato was um, it's carrots and peas for your for your swordsmanship, for, for sure. And you know, and I say that as someone who, you know, is my my love my personal love of swordsmanship is very typical i find i love the the long play i love the flashy stuff i love the the, the advanced techniques and the footwork and the movement you get out of swordsmanship i love that stuff and that's one of the reasons why i love bolognese so much but as i've one of the things i've had to learn at emma is that reality isn't always the way i like it and swordsmanship involves as much study of wrestling and dagger and stretto as it could ever do studying the depths of Largo. And, uh, you know, this is also something that Emma, I think, um, is rather insistent on stressing to its new students as a, as a, something of an aside. Um, a lot of HEMA schools tend to at least, uh, I think, play this fact down, this fact of swordsmanship down, uh, because everybody loves the clang, clang, clang of, of Largo. <laughs> Hmm. That's what crash yeah. fencing is about, though. But the yeah, schools, absolutely. The schools that are, you yeah. know, they like to play at blade, but they both realize pretty quickly that they're neither one of them is either particularly good or not better than the other. Because uh, I I haven't seen fights that weren't very one sided uh, ever ha ever look like anything other than a crash. Right. Uh, yeah. Someone that's got an awful lot of presence. The, the crash fencer has no advantage over. Uh, yeah, that's uh, oh, that's right. When, when mm -hmm. you see the guys, the guys from Montreal that came to visit us uh, about three, four years ago for, for our scholar tournament, I mean, they, those guys had no school or sword skills. So they they had no sense of uh, distance, and in fact, they didn't even uh, care whether they hit you with the flat or the edge. They they accepted both. So you know, playing against them, I'm sure a lot of people had fun, but. Uh, watching fight after fight after fight of that stuff because i was marshalling it it's just it's just ugh. <laughs> you know like well someone oh, put a plate of turnips in front of me you know it's not fun. You're, not a, you're not a fan of turnips well and, and 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 to further that point kel um one of the refreshing things about largo as opposed to strato right since we're making this comparison one of the refreshing things about largo is that you ought to believe that you can react successfully to anything that's thrown at you no matter how bullshit right no matter how difficult in in largo there's there's usually there's almost always something you could do to resolve it whereas sometimes with stretto as fury has said before in in dagger and wrestling sometimes counters some counters brook no defense right and there are some situations you can get into it in stretto where despite your best efforts you're not going to come out on top so that's another reason to prefer Largo if one had a choice, and to beware, um, to beware the Strato situation. Um, and with you know, with respect to this line here, both of us could perform each of them. Uh, Strato, at least in my experience, is one of those things where because of this, there's no time to wait. As soon as Strato happens, you want to be the first actor. 
right? In a similar sense to the dagger, there's no time to waste either with the dagger. Slightly different context, but still, you want to get in there. You want to get things going right away. Dagger is where you learn your measure. That's right. That's right. Um, okay. Well, all right. I think that's, you know, more or less uh, what we got for this evening. Um, let's go down the list and uh, the advanced students here. Um, oh, no. Where's Discord? Discord, Discord. Okay. Uh, uh, Andrew, would, do you have anything to add or subtract for this evening? Yeah. yeah I'm gl glad about the, uh, well, what, what Kel said, you know, emphasizing that, uh, Largo is where you win and stuff because I, I, I can still remember my first tournament, watching my first tournament when I was new to this. Mm -hmm. It was like ten, 10 years ago. I was watching guys, they'd clash with their swords once, they'd clash twice, and then they'd both drop their swords and start wrestling. <laughs> think, what, what are you guys doing? Shouldn't you be fighting with their swords? I mean, I'm new at this, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope one of those people wasn't me. Alright. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anything else to add there, uh, Andrew? No. No. Uh, thank you, sir, for your uh, contribution. BD. Yes. So, first of all, uh, distance, footwork, and measure are extremely important to stay at Largo and not accidentally enter into Stretto. Uh, a second point is that at Stretto, there's an extreme disadvantage for people that are much smaller mm -hmm. than the other person. Um, another point is that we see uh, there's several the chapters of Emma that had distinct preferences one way or the other, were at Largo or Strittle. Uh, so although I've, uh, I can personally attest to what, uh, what we're being told here about staying at Largo and Largo is where you win, because I've been hit many times trying to force my way to Strittle. Uh, it is interesting to see people of different philosophies fighting, one person that's very Strittle-based versus another one very Largo-based, mm -hmm. right? David Edo versus Bill Brickman, for example, is two mm -hmm. extremes. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the last point is, uh, I'm very interested coming up on the Wednesday session when we're, uh, we're talking about it in the scholar session, mm -hmm. looking at the counter to Strittle plays. And I've got a couple of personal pet theories about uh, counters mm -hmm. to Strittle. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, yeah, that's, that, those are my comments. Yeah, yeah. well, you actually Very bring up, a, yeah, yeah, and particularly about, you know, um, like, as we, as, blah, blah, blah. as we said before, there is some element of style. And preference in fencing, um, you know, to, to some degree. There's an element of creativity and uniqueness. And, you know, some people are going to naturally prefer styles that lend themselves to pressing to stretto more than some others, right? Um, and, and, and that's fine, right? Uh, you know, that's fine as far as it goes. And, and, to that larger point, we're not going to dwell on it, I, I think, because we're kind of over over time. But there is definitely an interesting discussion to be had about whether it's even possible to refuse to enter Stretto, right? It's it, it's possible, That's just as an as lie. an yeah, just as an idea that if someone who knows how to fence wants to enter into Stretto with you, it's possible that you might not be able to avoid it, right? It's possible. Uh, that that's a thing, which would, if that were true, make learning and having strato in your pocket even more critical for those situations. Um, but yeah, I look forward to discussing those very much uh, on Wednesday, BD. Um, yeah, all right, awesome. Uh, Connor. Well, um, in the time that I've been away and in the travel that I've done uh, in recent years, um, yeah, the importance that Emma lays on uh, focusing on the distinction between Largo and Stretto and the emphasis on practicing the entire breadth has served me well and been very important. Uh, the number of people, not to be dismissive, the number mm -hmm. of people that I have played with uh, in Europe and through China, getting close enough to touch their sword, the num there's a, certainly a distinct number of people that have frozen up when in put in that position mm -hmm. and there have also been people that i've played with and i have been close enough and attempted successfully and unsuccessfully to seize their sword and i remember one person said oh it's been a long time since i played a fiorist <laughs> it felt rather like a backhanded compliment <laughs> but it's, that's great but uh the point was i mean in that specific case, there was, again, that distinct backpedaling behavior mm. because this person did not want to engage at all at that distance. Mm. 
Because I think there's also a some people, not everyone, seems to think that stretto means you know cheek to cheek, but it doesn't have to be. Right. There's a lot of middle. Yeah, they there's don't. A lot of they middle. don't understand yeah. what the distinction is. Yeah, that's a um, Con Connor. If you don't mind, I, please do bring that up next next Monday. If you're here, I'll try to remember. But we're going to need to have a discussion about the distances in Stretto, because you're right, there is variation, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm mm -hmm. making a mm -hmm. note of it this mm -hmm. time, so Excellent. don't forget. Excellent. Right. So the bottom line of it is mm -hmm. I'm praising Emma's approach and the amount of emphasis that is played, that is given. All right. And last but certainly not least, Kel. Oh, I got nothing to add. I think uh, there have been some really excellent comments and uh although we didn't cover a lot of ground tonight i think philosophically we did cover a huge amount of ground that yeah. uh, the advanced students and and the scholars you know you have something to chew on in your mind is what you know why why this why that uh once you get into the mechanics of strato you'll <laughs> you'll never want to stay there mm. <laughs> It's not a play. It's not a happy place. Mm. You either win or you get crushed. Mm. That's about it. Anyways, I'm yeah, going to say off for tonight. Welcome. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining in the conversation and continuing your interest in, in what we're doing. For me, you know, being very remote, uh, having these discussions is, is a great help. So thank you for coming. Thank you all. And thank you all for coming. Uh, we'll meet you same bat time, same bat channel next week. Thanks, Aaron. Have a great night. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.